The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to In the 15th year, the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. In the name of the one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's hard to hear today's readings, particularly the one from Malachi and the one from Luke, without thinking of Handel's Messiah, particularly the tenor section, where the tenor section starts off in Handel's Messiah with a lot of what you hear in today's gospel about the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, and then the whole choir comes out with every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low. It's one of my favorite compositions, Handel's Messiah, often heard, usually around Christmas time. There can be no coming of God without preparation first. That's clearly what today's lessons are about, particularly that lesson from Malachi and from Luke. We're reading now in the Gospel of Luke, and the Gospel of Luke sets the stage in a very particular time frame. And this is one of those times when I was hoping that Mona Gaddis would be here to read today's gospel because there were some clearly some unpronounceable names that I was going to be watching very carefully to see if she pronounced them correctly. The reason she's not here, by the way, is she called me last night to say that she was having some back issues and please keep her in your prayers. But uh, yeah, she couldn't be here today because she's having a lot of back pain. But I was kidding her about this gospel lesson. She said, no, that's part of the reason I'm not coming tomorrow. <laughs> uh, she was kidding. But yes, you hear this very uh, interesting list of uh, names that are kind of surprising. But it says there in their, your gospel lesson, in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, that of all the names there is the one that we actually from information outside the Bible can actually date. We're told about the uh, Emperor Tiberius, in other words, he was the uh, Caesar at the time, and uh, roughly the 15th year of his reign would be circa, give or take, about the year 26 to 28 AD. Okay, so that's the time frame we're talking about. The rest of the names are kind of lost, and uh, they're basically mentioned in the Bible, but not necessarily elsewhere. When Pontius Pilate, okay, we got him, he's in our creed, was governor of Judea, Herod, which one? We don't know, was the ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, we don't know where those are, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, not Texas, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Yeah, they're mentioned on Good Friday. So a lot of that detail is lost in history. But Luke sets this in a very particular time frame. We kind of read through it quickly and, you know, stumble over the names. But the reason Luke is doing this is he really wants you to think in time. This happened in a particular time. This suddenly, in history, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius, that suddenly the forerunner of the Messiah was here and was beginning his earthly ministry. And this is John the Baptist. Now, I started off by saying, without 
Uh, there can be no coming without preparation. There can be no coming of God without preparation. The lessons today are clearly about preparation. The one there from Malachi is, is a call to all of the clergy, the sons of Levi. Again, as you hear this in the Messiah, all the sons of Levi are to be purified. In other words, the clergy are to be purified so that their offerings may be done in righteousness. All of that is all getting ready for that Messiah to set the stage for a Messiah to come. And that's what we're here to do. We're here to celebrate as we make our way through the Advent season, getting ready for the coming of God. The word adventum in Latin, meaning coming of God, from where we get the word advent. And so we're celebrating the coming of God in a particular time, in a particular space. My question is really about John the Baptist. Now, you've heard me talk about John the Baptist before. The mystery to me is why anyone actually would go out to hear him in the first place. He's described in other gospel, the Matthew's gospel, He's described as eating bugs, locusts, and wild honey with a leather belt around his waist. Do we really need that kind of information about what he wore around his waist? I mean, really? So the question is, why would they go out? Now, think about this. Put yourself in their place. You're living in Jerusalem. You are Jewish. You're living in Jerusalem, the center of your faith, the center of the then known world of your faith. It's as if God created the center of the world on planet Earth there in Jerusalem. The temple was there, the place where you would go and worship. Yeah, you knew what to do. You knew when to stand and kneel, and you knew when to hold out your hands and all that proper stuff. That felt comfortable and safe, but in a way, for many people, it had become a dead ritual. It just was doing the same thing all the time, kind of like we do, maybe? Huh? Ah. Just touching a little bit of nerve there. But you go through that. Now, if you're, again, living in Jerusalem, you are used to having your religion done a certain way. You do that forever, ever since you were a baby. And every time you go to, uh, to the temple, you take three baths. That's what you're supposed to do is you get near the temple. Now, I don't know about you. I know this is more information than you needed today, but I only had one bath today, one shower. But when you came near the temple precincts, you had to have three every time you had ritual baths. Now, just imagine how cold that would be, okay? They're kind of, you know, outside-ish sort of thing, so I don't know whether any of us would actually do this, but consider this, three ritual baths in order to get to the temple. But this is what you did every week as you came into the temple precincts. Now, you hear about this crazy, lunatic preacher out in the wilderness, 30 miles away at the lowest spot on planet Earth. Yep, the Dead Sea is the lowest spot on planet Earth, okay? So would you go 30 miles, walking through the wilderness, not driving, walking, out there 30, 30 miles, maybe by yourself, out there where there were wolves, Bandits, we don't know, all the way downhill to the lowest spot on planet Earth. You get there and you just line up with everybody else. You see that line is long. Would you join? Would you say, sure, count me in? Would you go at all? That's my question. Well, people did. A lot of people did. They were lined up and went into that muddy Jordan River. Now, I've been there. I went there twice, actually, in the mid-1990s. I think it was there in 1996 and 1997. And what struck me about the Jordan River is not big. I, I guess I was kind of picturing it would be like the mighty Mississippi, you know. Um, you've ever been to the, seen the Mississippi, say, around Memphis? Uh, it's wide. It's like two or three miles wide at its widest point. And you cross a bridge, and it's like about a two or three mile long bridge. That's not what the Jordan is like at all. Think of it more like a, like a creek, okay? Maybe, maybe 100 uh, feet wide. It's also muddy. It's also salty, because it's real near the Dead Sea, which is also known as the Salt Sea. It's loaded with petroleum. It's in that part of the uh, basin there where you just feel oily and slick, okay, and muddy. Would you do this? Well, I, I wouldn't either, actually. But a lot of people did. And I often wonder why. What was going on? Well, if your religion had become so perfunctory, 
So, you know, wrote, you know, you knew what to expect. You knew when to stand, when to kneel, when, when to turn in your pledge card. You knew when to do all those right things, which we're not knocking, by the way. What, we, what I am drawing attention to is the attitude of the people who went out into the Judean wilderness. They went out, I think, if I were to just put myself into their place, I think they went out there to come clean, so to speak, to start afresh and anew. Just imagine that you have had your religion, the center of your faith, so perfunctory that somebody was offering you something new, something profound, a chance for you to come clean with God, with each other, in a new way. And so these people line up. Imagine you taking your spot, and suddenly it's now your turn to get out there into the muddy Jordan. And John the Baptist is standing there, and he says, do you repent of your sins? And you say, I will, or I do, with God's help, or something like that. And you do this, and he baptizes you. He either dunks you down in the water, ick, or he puts some up on your head. However he did it, he baptized all, you included, including Jesus, by the way, if you recall. So would you do it? I don't know. Can't answer that one for you. I probably wouldn't, frankly. I probably wouldn't go out of my way. But just think, just imagine what the people who had gone out of their way had to look forward to after that. I imagine that climbing back up to Jerusalem above sea level. Remember, they're well about uh, 1,200, 1,300 feet below sea level. Now they're about 1,300 feet above sea level, sea level. They're going all the way back up to Jerusalem. I think that burden of going back uphill was not nearly as heavy as going down to that water. Let me give you another illustration, perhaps a little bit more contemporary. Charles Dickens. He writes a story we call A Christmas Carol. You remember Ebenezer Scrooge? Do you remember his partner, Jacob Marley? Do you remember Jacob Marley pictured there with chains and counting boxes all, you know, forever and eternity? And do you remember Ebenezer Scrooge, that scary encounter? He's transformed, isn't he? In one night, he, in a way, comes to terms with his ghosts, the things about his past, the things about his present, and the things that if he keeps living his life the way he's living it, into the future. And in the end, he's given an opportunity to what? To start again, afresh and anew. He's transformed in one night, and we remember that story every Christmas. I love it. I love the story of Ebenezer Scrooge. It's a story about transformation, and it can happen to every one of us, any one of us, if we come clean. If we face our ghosts, so to speak, whatever ghosts we have about our past, those things that kind of haunt us, you know what I'm talking about, those things that get down into the soul that scare us about our past, about things that just simply keep chipping away at our soul today in the present, you know where it might lead into the future. I don't know what ghosts you brought in with you here today. I don't know what brokenness you brought in here today. But John the Baptist offers a way of coming clean. John the Baptist presents a way to prepare for the coming of God. Prepare the way of the Lord. And he actually says it this way. Every valley, those deep things, will be filled. Every mountain, those things that seem insurmountable, will be made low. Crooked, those things that are crooked, will be made straight and rough will be made smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. Isn't that what we're looking for anyway? Really? At this second Sunday in the Advent season, we're given an opportunity to come clean, so to speak, to acknowledge that there are those areas in our soul, down deep in our soul, down deep in our gut, that's maybe a better description, to say that there are ghosts of our past that we don't like. We've all got them. We've all got those ghosts about things that haunt us every day. They don't have to, is what I'm saying. And I think that's what Charles Dickens was saying with Ebenezer Scrooge. He's giving us an opportunity to start afresh, to let that, what is in our crash over here, that little empty, 
manger. Jesus isn't in there yet to let that little empty manger that's inside here where God can be born. It can happen. It really can. It can happen to each and every one of us. Myself too. Will we be open to it? That call to repent. An opportunity to turn around and go a new direction. It's what Ebenezer Scrooge did from Christmas Day on. He was transformed. And you can too. Amen.